check out the Warning Woods merch. The store has shirts and hats in a variety of styles and colors, as well as mugs, phone cases, and more. Thank you for your support. Welcome, friend. Follow me. We're going somewhere dark, somewhere dangerous. There's no telling what horrors we might find. Are you afraid? Good. Now you are ready to enter the Warning Woods. I wanted to fly. I wanted to find Craig Carpenter and punch him right in his overbitten jaw. I wanted to jump on stage at a concert and sing while a crowd chanted my name. I wanted to drive 200 miles per hour and crash into the ocean and find Atlantis and marry a beautiful mermaid who looked a lot like Sasha from Chemistry. I knew I could do all of this. I only had to take control of my dreams. If you don't know, lucid dreaming means taking control of your dreams while they're happening. You wake up while maintaining the dream state. This makes you God. Your only limitations are the boundaries of your imagination. You can generate places, objects, people. You can be who or whatever you want. For however long you can maintain the lucid state, you are genuinely free. The process of lucid dreaming is really quite simple to explain, but most people have a hard time executing it. The easiest part is starting a dream journal. You have to keep it right next to your bed so you can roll over and write your dreams down right after they happen. Be as specific as you can without losing your slippery grip on the memory or whatever that squishy impression a dream leaves is called. You're training your brain to be present in the dream state. You're not interacting or interfering yet, just observing. You should notice your dream recall improve over time, and the vividness and frequency of your dreams will likely increase in parallel. Your goal is to eventually become aware you are dreaming while it is happening. For most, the real work starts there. Staying in the dream will test you. The excitement that first time you become aware become lucid, jerks most dreamers out of sleep. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Achieving omnipotent power is just a little startling at first. The problem most people cannot overcome is the anxiety which follows that first experience. They wake themselves up every subsequent time they become lucid because they expect to wake up. It takes a steady, practiced mind to remain in the dream. I tried lucid dreaming late in high school, but I never surpassed the paradoxical anxiety. I never flew or married a mermaid who looked like Sasha. I didn't even get to hit Craig Carpenter. You know, truthfully, what I wanted to do most was practice fitting in. I wanted to learn how to make people like me. But after my first time becoming lucid, I could never do it again, and I became cynical about it. As time moved forward, I became cynical about a lot of things. I let the wonder, the what-if spirit of my youth die. Six months ago, existentially bored with my mundane routine, I started wondering if I might have better luck lucid dreaming as an adult. I found my old dream journal and put it on my nightstand with a pen just to see what might happen. I'm 28, single, no kids. I have few friends, and those few happen to be co-workers. We don't really hang out away from the office. My parents live within reasonable driving distance, but I'm terrible about making plans to go see them, so I only visit once or twice a year. None of this really matters except that my semi-isolated existence doesn't lend much to dreaming. The first new dreams I recorded seemed more boring than sleep itself as I wrote them down. I frequently dreamt about Zoom meetings, if you can believe it. 
Once my coworkers were replaced by Saturday Night Live cast members from various eras of the show, but the excitement peaked there. It sort of seemed like my brain realized I was watching its nightly programming again and decided to step up its game after the first couple of weeks. I had one of my most vivid dreams ever about going to the Grand Canyon, somewhere I hadn't visited since I was six years old. When I read my old dreams from high school, they sounded so exciting. I thought something must be missing now, something I had lost back then, something I had let go of. Waking each morning, I would immediately open my dream journal to read what I'd written during the night. Oftentimes, my recollection of the dreams described by the pages started underwater and slowly rose to the surface. With time, my subconscious awareness strengthened, though. I found myself spending all day at the office daydreaming about going to sleep, plotting dreams. Then came the night. The night the night I became lucid for the first time. Well, I guess for the first time since high school. I don't really count that one since I woke up immediately, though. This time, I had prepared. I had spent hours every day running the mantra, stay asleep, stay awake, through my mind until it became a verbal backdrop to my thoughts. The dream itself could have been more exciting. Back at the Grand Canyon, I looked down from some guard-railed vantage point. Below me, a shimmering lake reflected the setting sun and vivid pink sky. I noticed a man scaling the gritty vertical wall directly below me. The lake below the climber changed into a glittering town. The tinsel lights below took on familiar shapes. I recognized the town I grew up in situated down there in the basin of the Grand Canyon where no town has ever existed to my knowledge. That's about when I started becoming lucid. Stay asleep, stay awake. My mantra played like lyrics running by on an LED screen at a concert. I started gathering sensory information. I felt icy wind on my skin and realized the setting sun had already swapped with a big desert moon and innumerable stars. I don't remember any smells or tastes, which are rare in dreams anyway but I do distinctly remember the sound. I did not understand it at the time, but later I would. Clattering dishes, chattering voices, screeching metal on cement, the sounds of cafeteria clamor. Together, they made one unmistakable noise, which I had not heard for a decade, but heard in my dream while staring down into the Grand Canyon at my hometown, glimmering up like a lake reflecting the stars above and staring at that mysterious, huffing man climbing towards me, coming for me. He kept me there at that vantage point when I probably could have flown away. Perhaps I could have conjured an entirely new location, new scenario, but something about that man held me in place. I felt afraid of him. I felt he would follow me to whatever realm I constructed and I worried I might make it easier for him to catch me by leaving the safety of that high place. I wondered if my subconscious had placed me at the top of the canyon to protect me from whatever he was. But I could not stop him from climbing. Over the course of a week, the man climbed. I went to sleep each night imagining jungles and oceans and beautiful fjords, but my mind consistently placed me in that vantage point at the Grand Canyon. Each night, upon becoming lucid, I checked the climbing man's progress. I gauged how soon he would reach me. The constant shadow of night, for I never saw the canyon in daylight anymore, made it difficult to define the man's features. He had dark, shaggy hair and a puffy coat that might have been blue or indigo, but I could see nothing else. Occasionally he looked up toward me, maybe at me, and the moonlight would reflect off his eyes, much like a cat's eyes in glaring headlights. Do you know what I mean? Cat's eyes don't just reflect light straight back, they seem to absorb and change the light. Their pupils take on a mystical green color, 
or sometimes red, and they appear sort of flat. The climbing man's pupils looked like that, green, glowing, and empty. He would only allow me a brief glimpse of them before looking away as if I had caught him staring. He moved slowly, but not from exhaustion. His methodical pace told me he knew I wasn't going anywhere. On a Saturday night, if I'm remembering correctly, I tried something new. After becoming lucid, I tried to will away the climbing man. I pictured him gone. I assumed, since it was my dream, my world, if I didn't want him in it anymore, I could just make him vanish. Poof. But the man defied me. Not only did he stay, he now began to watch me constantly, staring up with those flat, green eyes. I could see his hands now, too. They dug into the rock as if it were clay. Not even stone could counter the man's desire to catch me. By Sunday night, he had scaled high enough for me to finally make out his features. The face I saw staring up at me, with the exception of those terrible eyes, was my own. His skin looked more elastic than mine. His cheeks were slightly leaner, showing clenching jaw muscles. He looked how I had at 17 or 18 years old. His hair looked oily and neglected, but despite his arduous climb, not one bead of sweat dotted his forehead. I tried picturing him in a different way, projecting a generic image of a scraggly bearded climber, but the face looking up at me remained my own. I tried calling down to him, Hello. But when I shouted, his mouth opened too. Like the moonlight reflecting from his eyes, my voice reflected from his mouth, calling back up to me and echoing through the canyon. That moment tore the fabric of the dream in two. I lost control. Whether I technically remained lucid, I'm not sure, but I lost control of my dream body. The dream held me, staring over the rail down into the face of my younger self as he, or I, climbed ever higher. The moon dulled, but no clouds floated in front of it. The sky just darkened. The twinkling lights below flickered and also dulled like candles burned to the ends of their wicks. In seconds, all light faded, except the two green ones pointed up at me, at where I stood, paralyzed, clutching the cold steel rail. The next thing I remember was waking up to my radio alarm clock playing, of all things, Dreams by Fleetwood Mac. I reached across my body with my right hand to shut it off, then stopped. I squinted, squeezed my blurry eyes shut, then opened them again. The fingers of my right hand were covered in black smudges. I rubbed my eyes on my shoulders to further clear them, then saw the sheets, too, had dark splotches like a spreading disease. Everywhere my fingers had rubbed, they left dark smudges. After I turned on the light, I saw my naked chest and right thigh, where I must have scratched during the night, were blighted with the black substance. I ran straight to the bathroom to scrub at my hand. The white, lilac-scented suds turned gray as I twisted my hands together, but when I rinsed them, not only was the right still stained, but now the left had acquired a shadow too. I checked my face and opened my mouth wide to examine it in the mirror, checking for signs of disease in my teeth, gums, under my tongue, at the back of my throat. I peered up my nose and at my ears as well. Thankfully, my innards seemed unaffected. Confused and concerned, I returned to my bedroom to examine the scene and search for an explanation, which I found almost immediately. In my panic, I had passed right by the nightstand on which I kept my dream journal. Although I had no recollection of waking after the dream to record it, apparently I had, or I had attempted to at least. Somehow my conscious mind slept right through my hand picking up the plastic ballpoint pen I kept with the journal, and apparently crushing it. 
The pen lay in two halves on either side of the ink-stained journal. Black puddles pooled around both items. I scrounged up some paper towels and soaked up most of it, but as I'm sure you can imagine, the ink left a permanent stain on everything it touched. I assumed I had reached for the pen in a state like sleepwalking, probably fumbled for it, and crushed it against the nightstand. Since I could only recall the one dream and had no memory of recording it, I didn't bother to open the dream journal until I finished cleaning everything as well as I could, to include myself. In the hot shower, with steam melting my skin and blue-gray water running from my toes, the idea that I should check the journal hit me. I completed my shower at a leisurely pace, then, with my towel wrapped around my waist, returned to the bedroom. I flipped through the journal, glad to see none of the interior pages had been ruined, until I came to the last entry I remembered making. Seeping stains wrinkled and smeared the words on that page. So, I thought, I did break the pen while writing in the journal. I had to peel the marked page open, being careful not to tear it. Dried ink encrusted the entire page. The ink washed away any words I had written there, and it did seem I had written something. Impressions from a few violent letters made shallow trenches in the flooded page. I opened the next page, on which nothing had been written directly, but it bore my scribbled message all the same. I had pressed the pen so hard on the previous page that I carved each and every word, every letter, in faint channels on the next page. When I tilted the journal just right beneath the light, I could make out what it said. He's reached the top. He's coming. He's coming. Almost here. Wake up. Wake up. Wake. Writing the last E, the pen had shattered, broken by my own desperate and panicked hand. I immediately assumed, of course, that he referred to the climbing man. I wondered, had the dream continued after my awareness ceased? I've mentioned I felt frightened of the man within the dream, but understand I felt no fear of him after waking before that day. Why had I been so intent on waking up? And why so tense that I had shattered a pen between my fingers? And why? This question really lingered with me. Had I not woken up even when the pen broke? I would later learn why. I would also learn it didn't break accidentally. Someone had forcefully stopped me from writing. You spend most days on autopilot, whether you realize it or not. Yes, you're making conscious decisions throughout the day, but at the end of it, how many of those decisions can you recall? How much detail can you remember about what you did two hours ago? I'm guessing your workday, in particular, is blurry. That was the case for me, anyway. Day in and day out at the office, with no exception made for the day I woke up covered in ink. I went into the office, did something or other, and came home. Then I did Lord knows what until bed. My coherent memory picks up there, because as I prepared for sleep, I felt scared. He's almost here. Wake up, I had written. Well, I'd woken up, had I not? But what would happen after I fell asleep again? I stayed up way too late, figuring I would call in sick to work the next day if I felt too groggy. I watched some of my favorite comedy movies, then went for a long night walk to get my blood pumping again, all to avoid sleep. I felt like one of the kids in Nightmare on Elm Street, only instead of a burned-up madman actively trying to kill me, my villain was just a younger version of me. Finally, after trying to stay awake during the cheesy late-night talk shows, I succumbed. I had no dreams. None I could recall, anyway. I stirred the next morning, briefly opening my leaden eyes on my pillow, in my bed, next to the ink-stained nightstand. My clock blinked 704. I felt my eyes closing again on their own, and as I drifted off, I thought, when did I get off the couch? 
and I should probably call the office. Too late. I jolted awake in sheer panic around 11 that morning. A swarm of alarms about falling behind or getting fired shot through my mind before I realized I was sitting in my cubicle at the office. I couldn't remember leaving bed, but somehow I ended up at work. Autopilot? No, getting dressed and driving my car across town were tasks I only joked I could do in my sleep. Looks like somebody's coffee finally kicked in, someone said behind me. I spun my chair to face Francis, my coworker from across the aisle. Francis, one of the most senior employees who had never taken a management position, acted like my surrogate mother. She could smother at times, but on that day, I welcomed her care and attention. Somebody else looking out for me made me feel safe for the moment. You were like a zombie coming in here, Francis said. Did you sleep okay? Barely at all, I said. Possibly lying, I'm not sure. I certainly didn't feel well rested. I can tell, she said. You look about ten years older than you did an hour ago. I expressed mocking offense and she quickly added, Honey, you look fine. Besides the crow's feet, it's just the bags under your eyes. Nothing a good night's sleep won't fix. Well, not the crow's feet. I forced a smile and said, Well, I'll try to get one tonight. Francis said, You'd better. Anything for you, Fran? I turned back to my work. What work? I can't remember. Autopilot had already taken over. I was too busy trying to recall the morning and thinking about the night ahead. I decided to switch tactics. Instead of holding myself hostage from sleep, I took some melatonin and went to bed early. I needed to find my younger twin again and whatever answers he held. I read until my eyes started closing on their own. I turned off my lamp, checked that my new metal pen still rested beside my dream journal and let the melatonin do its work. I dreamt. This time, for the first time in about a week, I found myself not at the top of the Grand Canyon, but in my kitchen, staring at the sink. The same dirty dishes I had left in it that evening rested at the bottom of the basin, soaking in two inches of water, just as I had left them. I marveled at the accuracy of this recreation, if you ever do become aware in a dream, you'll probably notice little things that are off-kilter, missing, wrong, etc. Not in this dream. I may as well have been standing in my real kitchen. I chose at first not to take over, but rather to observe. With the drastic shift from the Grand Canyon to my kitchen sink, I had to know what my subconscious brain had planned. From behind my dreaming eyes, I walked room to room, never pausing for any particular reason but to examine some mundane object. The TV remote, the ottoman, a stool that sits in the corner of my home office for no particular reason, a jar of pens. I followed the dream into my bathroom where I stared for a long time at the straight razor next to the sink. I picked it up, slowly unfolding it. I held the blade, which I'd just sharpened a week before, to my thumb. To prevent myself from witnessing some horrible act, I nearly took control. But as if sensing my intention, my hands folded the razor and replaced it. My view pivoted slowly. It faced the toilet, then the sink again. Then it turned slightly upward, looking directly into the mirror. Although the baggy, crow-footed face in the mirror belonged to me, the eyes reflected in the mirror were the same flat, green ones I had seen on the climbing man. At that moment, I had two choices. I could retreat, or I could take over, stay in the dream, and possibly see it through to the end. Obviously, I chose the latter, not that I really made much of a decision. Taking over, becoming lucid, happened more or less automatically, the way your foot moves to the brake pedal when you see a green light turn yellow. And when I became lucid, 
the reflective green vanished from my eyes in the mirror. I stood there, without a clue what I should do next. I stood, waiting for some sign, realizing the striking perfection with which the dream recreated my bathroom. Even the mildly musty smell of the shower curtain lingered, true to reality. A disturbing notion came to me, a possibility less unsettling than waking up at work halfway through the day, but still quite perturbing. As a test, I ran the cold tap until the water reached its lowest temperature. I put one finger into the stream. Nothing changed. I felt the biting chill and gentle force from the running water, but it did not startle me awake as I expected or hoped it would. Still nothing changed when I submerged my entire hand. I cupped both hands together, filling them with frigid tap water and splashed it onto my face. I made no effort to keep the water from running down my neck onto my bare chest and back. It ran down my arms in cutting droplets. I shivered violently as one ambitious bead slid down the length of my spine, but still I did not wake. Because, as I feared, I was already awake. I had not taken over any dream. I had reclaimed control of my body. I took sick leave from work the following day. I did not dare go back to sleep. I spent the day doing a mixture of research and meditation, attempting to solve my green-eyed affliction. Eventually, I determined there must have been an exchange of realities. I had gone into the dream world and become lucid, gaining control there as an independent entity. And my twin had done the same, only in my world in me. I came away from this discovery absolutely certain I could not fall asleep until I was ready to face the climbing man, who I began to think of as the other. I searched my mind, digging into my subconscious to see if I could locate the being within it and drag it into my world, but I could not. I would have to face it in its own world. I would have to go to sleep. So that is what I did. I first awoke on the other side in total darkness. The ground felt hard and jagged like the base of a cave or a canyon. I could see, smell, and hear nothing. Feeling around me for a wall with which I could orient myself, I felt like the man from Poe's The Pit in the Pendulum, blind and stumbling in the dark. No sooner had this comparison reached me than I heard a low whooshing sound undoubtedly an enormous pendulum swinging toward me like an executioner's axe. I flattened myself to the ground and felt the rush of air pass over me, but I felt no fear. The sudden manifestation of the pendulum made me realize my power over the dream. I squeezed my eyes shut, imagined the guard-railed vantage point above the Grand Canyon, and when I opened my eyes again, that is exactly where I stood. Despite manifesting the canyon on my own, certain elements still seemed outside of my control, or at least beyond my will. Namely, the cafeteria clamor, present as ever, banging around in the air. I tried to erase the noise, but it persisted. I decided it must have been inexorably tied to whatever the canyon dream represented. I stared down, unsurprised at the absence of the green-eyed dream climber. He, I knew, was in my world, doing God knew what. I had to act quickly before he did anything to ruin my comfortable life. The twinkling city at the base of the canyon called to me. The time had come to try one of the top three reasons I'd wanted to lucid dream in the first place, going all the way back to my first attempts. The time had come to fly. I climbed up on the guardrail. I took one long look at the full moon above and the unadulterated beach of stars, then leapt. My animal brain knew what to expect, so at first I fell. The initial fear of that dreaded sensation almost woke me. Determined not to allow this, I spread my arms, straightened my legs, 
and opened my eyes against the rushing air. And then I flew. I soared above the city lights, circling down in a loose spiral. When the top of a building, one of my parents' old office buildings, I think, was near enough, I leaned back for a perfect landing. The building must have been seven stories tall, but I stepped over the edge and gently floated to the empty street below. The city, I realized as I took it in, was not my hometown, just the dream's representation of my subconscious. The buildings were all familiar, but I recognized many from other towns and cities among those from my hometown. But the cafeteria clamor told me exactly where to go. I opened the glass front door and entered the familiar foyer. My old public high school looked exactly how I remembered it on the outside, but I had never seen it so dark and lifeless inside. Any illumination came from the red exit signs at the end of each hall. Deeper in the building, I could hear the very sounds which I had heard from atop the canyon, only now they were dry and echoless. As I walked toward the cafeteria, I passed a section of wall with a floor-to-ceiling photograph printed on it. I had seen the photo hundreds if not thousands of times, but forgotten it almost entirely. The photo had been taken by a student in the photography club on a field trip to the Grand Canyon. He took it from the very vantage point which my dream had manifested. I had been meant to come to the school the entire time. Stay asleep, stay awake. Anxiously, I sped toward the cafeteria's double doors. I could not remember ever seeing them closed, big windowless things that totally hid the enormous room behind them. Before second guessing, I pushed both doors open. The clattering noises, the voices, all went silent. Never had I experienced the cafeteria as a place so forlorn and lonely. Not even an ambient hum vibrated the air. It was still. It was empty. A foreign thought, which began as an anxious tingle, nearly shook my hold on the dream, if the term dream could still be used at that point. The thought, or feeling, was that I had just stumbled into the lair, the nest, the mother's womb of my possessor. The temptation to wake myself whispered to me, but I quickly reasoned it away, because I had set a trap. Yes, I had prepared the real world for its nighttime visitor. All I could do was wait. Before going to sleep, I had spent hours dwelling on how to put the other back in the dream without removing myself. It seemed the only way to eject him from my body was to wake myself up, but then I would lose access to the dream. I had to confront the other. Maybe I needed to destroy it, but I would have no chance for either if we kept swapping back and forth between our worlds. I considered what had caused our switch the last time the other took control the bathroom mirror. I thought I had slipped out of the dream because I saw the green-eyed reflection, but I played with the idea that I had it backwards. What if, I wondered, the other had lost its own grip due to seeing the reflection, much like I had lost my ability to lucid dream in high school due to my hyper-awareness of the dream. Banking everything on this theory, it was the best I had. I moved a large mirror from my living room into my bedroom, standing it against the inside of the closed bedroom door. This way, before the other could leave my bedroom, it would see its reflection again. If I knew it was coming, even if not exactly when, I thought I might be able to prevent myself from getting rotated out of the dream world when the other fell back in. At the very least, even if the rest did not work as I planned, I would wake up before the other had a chance to walk away with my body. I sat at a dusty table in the chilly cafeteria to wait. Windows looked down on me from two perpendicular walls, but the glass appeared black and marbled. 
the only light again came from the red exit sign above an absent door. I turned back toward the big cafeteria doors and saw those two had vanished after I'd passed through them. Whatever the outcome, I had reached the end of my journey. With a pop like a power breaker exploding, the overhead lights stuttered on. I stood so quickly I banged my knee on a bar beneath the table. Such a familiar sensation. Freeing my legs from the bench, I spun around. In front of the blank wall where the double doors should have been, the green-eyed other stood, glaring at me beneath its oily dark hair. How? It demanded. I stammered something incoherent and took two steps backwards. How could you? It asked again. I said, I don't... I didn't know what else to do. The other sprung over a table, utilizing fictitious physics. When it struck me, knocking me to the ground, I awoke on the floor of my bedroom in front of the mirror. It had been cracked by a fist in one corner. My left fist, judging by the dozen lacerations I saw on my knuckles. You should have seen how quickly I scrambled into bed. I stiffened into a corpse, trying to force myself back into the dream. I utilized meditation techniques and breathwork exercises. Hazy images from the cafeteria began to sharpen in my dreaming eyes. I consciously relaxed my body, expanding the aperture of my mind, pulling the dream closer. I woke to the other, straddling my prone body, fists raised above its head, ready to come down. Gasping, I gained lucidity. With my left hand, I guarded my face while my right shot into the other's hair. I grabbed a fistful and tugged it down. How could you? The other repeated yet again. That's how bad I want you out of my head, I growled, pinning the other's face to a bench. No, the other shouted, eyes widening. How could you leave me here? He stopped struggling. His eyes met mine, showing less green than before. He really looked just like a 17-year-old version of myself. A perfect recreation. Leave you where? In this dream? I asked. I can't have you walking around as me out there. I could have come with you, but you left me here, it said. Not just now, but whenever it was. Years ago, I bet. I don't know. Time doesn't feel like it moves here. Trusting him, I released his hair and let him sit up straight. As a reward, he stood off of me and sat on the bench where his cheek had been pressed a few seconds earlier. I brushed myself off and sat on the bench across from him. Just tell me what you mean, I invited, leaning forward. The other looked away as he spoke. When you first came here, it was great. Everyone loved you. Well, you had your issues with Craig Carpenter, I guess, but you dominated him every time you crossed paths, right? And Sasha, oh, do you remember Sasha? Man, she had it for you, dude. Yeah, I interrupted, but only in my dreams. Literally, my life wasn't anything like that in the real world. How would I know? The other asked. The dream world is my real world. It's all I've ever known. So, are you like my subconscious? I asked. No, we're in your subconscious. You got that much right earlier. I mean, I'm not sure how else you would have ended up back here. What's so important about being back here? I asked. He said, This is where you came when you tried to lucid dream before, right? You wanted to see if you could practice being confident and cool here. But you got frustrated. You got cynical. It didn't work, I shouted. What was he trying to do, make me feel guilty? He wasn't even real, I thought. He was me, or a piece of me. You gave up, he said. You gave up on a lot of things after that too, didn't you? I went to your office. I saw that place where your best friend is a woman who could be your grandma. You're bringing Francis into this? 
the other me stood. I saw the corners of his mouth twitch the way mine do when I'm about to cry but don't want to. He turned away from me, scratched the back of his head where I had gripped that clump of hair, and said, You gave up on everything because you left me here. Then I did give up. I gave up on trying to guess what was going on and asked him the most pointed question I could, one which I thought I'd known the answer to already. Who are you, really? The other me said, I'm who you were. I'm your youth, your passion, your creativity. You left me here back in high school and this is where I've stayed. Sasha, Craig Carpenter, everyone else, they're all gone. They're probably doing amazing things right now, yeah? But here I am, stuck back here forever. Despite the confusing concept, I knew exactly what he meant. I had ditched dream after dream during or shortly after my senior year. Beginning around the same time I failed my lucid dreaming experiment, I succumbed to a life of mundanity. And Sasha? She has two movies out with Rotten Tomato scores in the 90s. Craig Carpenter? He does marketing for some software company that blew up overnight over social media due to some mildly inappropriate but wildly creative ads. Of the three of us, on paper I should have been the one to succeed. It should have been my name in the headlines. But my only mentions on Google are my LinkedIn profile and an article written about the time I donated my dad's old encyclopedias to the homeless shelter. So what did Sasha and Craig have that I didn't? Could it be that youthful vigor we were all buzzed on in school? It's not too late, the other me said. I believe you can still take me with you. How, I asked. How can we both exist inside one mind? Easy, the other answered. Because we're whole together. Apart, we're missing pieces. Look at me. He flashed me those flat, green eyes. Without you and your knowledge and experience, I'm blind. Should I describe what happened next? It was sort of, I don't know, corny. The cafeteria doors appeared again, and my other half and I walked out into the white-lit hallways. We walked out into warm sunlight. Together, we flew up to the vantage point and looked down into the lights of my subconscious. When I turned to ask if he was ready, he was gone. But I felt renewed, and I knew he was with me. I woke in my bed, whole. I quit that stuffy office job that very day. I went in to deliver my notice in person, and Frances stopped me on the way out. She congratulated me and told me I looked better better than she had ever seen me before. I told her I felt better than ever before, and the smile she gave me definitely got its own room in my subconscious city, rent-free. What am I doing now? Searching, thinking, planning, but not too carefully. I've spent long enough playing it safe. It's time for adventure, and not only when I'm asleep. You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate and review this podcast wherever you like to listen. Reviews are the best way to support the podcast and help it grow. The next best way is to buy merch from the warningwoods.myshopify.com. The link is also in the description below. If you want more creepy content, follow me on Instagram at the Warning Woods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this story, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. You will get a new story every week if you do. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening.